Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm delighted to welcome you to this uh, conversation with Jake Sullivan here at the Dickey Center. Um, many of you, if you, uh, if you read newspapers, will have heard of Jake Sullivan before, uh, but however many times you may have seen his name in the paper, uh, his centrality to the key issues of the day has been uh, exponentially greater. And to illustrate that point, I want to recount one little bit of research I did uh, several years ago when I was still in government. I, I was working on counterterrorism, which is a genuinely transnational issue, and I got to know lots of different people in different areas of the White House and the various agencies in the executive branch. And whenever I asked them who was their go-to guy in the State Department, uh, whether it was the relevant assistant secretary or an undersecretary or the counselor, the question was invariably answered, well, sure, we talked to all those people, but if it's important, we just go to Jake. And um, uh, it was, to me, just staggering to imagine uh, any one person getting uh, so many emails, texts, and, and phone calls, regular and secure, in the course of the day, but uh, that, in fact, was the reality of uh, the first Obama term at the State Department. And as a result, uh, Jake became one of that uh, small number of people who enjoyed true celebrity in Washington and was referred to like Bono, Madonna, and Sting by only one name, Jake. <laughs> and I am not making this up. <laughs> uh, to put it simply, Jake Sullivan was the day-to-day -day policy person who uh, more than anyone else had Secretary Hillary Clinton's ear, and he was the man who could ensure that issues got to her uh, attention when they needed to, and, that, um, and she was the person whose opinion she asked for last in any conversation. Um, I know from firsthand experience that she relied on his remarkable judgment, his ability to boil down incredibly complex issues in almost no time, and to separate the meaningful from the trivial, to weigh the bewildering and innumerable pros and cons that came with every issue that made it to the seventh floor of the department. Uh, and I have to say that I am personally quite grateful that he, uh, he was so supportive and, uh, and uh, generous with his advice on many of the critical issues that we faced when dealing with counterterrorism. After four years of ever increasing responsibility in the department, and for much of that time, he was both deputy chief of staff and director of policy planning, and as such was the heir to George Kennan, Paul Nitza, and Walt Rostow, uh, plenty of others in Washington were eager to get the benefit of Jake's remarkable skills. Most of his colleagues in the department couldn't imagine that anyone could have the energy to continue after four years seemingly without a break and travels to, correct me if I'm wrong, Jake, 112 countries and 150 cities with Secretary Clinton. Uh, and you didn't get any miles because you were on the plane. Um, <laughs> Uh, nonetheless, he accepted uh, an offer from Vice President Biden to become his national security advisor, which gave him a voice in the innermost circle in the White House. And by all accounts, it was a voice that the president especially valued. And when he did finally escape the black hole pole of Washington just last August and accepted a job teaching at Yale Law School, he was still enlisted to remain a special government employee to continue the sensitive work he'd been doing on the nuclear talks with Iran. Well, it's a pretty amazing record, and it's worth mentioning just a few other things in Jake's background. He holds undergraduate and law degrees from uh, Yale, where he was editor of both the Yale Daily News and the Yale Law Journal, although not at the same time. Uh, in between those stints, he acquired a master's from Oxford in uh, international relations while on a Rhodes Scholarship, and he clerked both on the U.S. Court of Appeals with just, Justice Guido Calabresi and on the Supreme Court with Justice Stephen Breyer. Uh, I could go on, uh, but I think that's enough for now and dispiriting enough for the rest of us. Uh, but it is worth noting, as Wikipedia does, that in high school he was also voted most likely to succeed. <laughs> anyway, I just want to uh, make uh, abundantly clear how grateful I am uh, that Jake could make time for us and visit Dartmouth. I know that it helps that we have good cross-country skiing in the area and that he relishes a climate like that of his native Minnesota. Uh, but none the same, uh, nonetheless, we're all uh, delighted uh, and really pleased to welcome him here in Hanover. So do you find you have too much free time on your hands now? <laughs> Uh, keeping busy. You're keeping busy. 
Well, um, so given that um, the issue that you're most uh, associated with these days is Iran, and since it's in the papers a lot lately, uh, I will, um, why don't we start there, and I'll uh, try not to ask you to uh, uh, divulge anything that would, um, you know, result in the Justice Department knocking down the doors and <laughs> doing some of those other things that they've been doing to former government officials. Um, are we going to get a deal? What do you think? <laughs> Big question. Big question. Uh, there is a deal to be had. There is a deal that can give the international community confidence uh, that Iran's nuclear activities are exclusively peaceful. Um, but that deal is going to require very hard choices in Tehran. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the reason we are having these negotiations is because the world presently lacks confidence in what Iran is up to with its nuclear program. And the ultimate solution lies in their willingness to take on board the types of constraints and transparency measures that would get us there. Whether or not that happens or not is still an open question. It is still the subject of incredibly intense negotiation. Uh, and the next couple of months will be particularly uh, decisive, I think, in determining whether we are going to get to a negotiated outcome. I guess one of the problems in dealing with Iran, and this isn't always I think appreciated in the, U in the US, is that it's, it's a very strange polity that has essentially two governments trying to work alongside each other. Uh, there's the, the uh, constitutional government, and then there's the religious hierarchy and the supreme leader. And it raises the question of you know, whether it's even possible to, for Iran to actually come to a decision. They're great at keeping the bargaining going uh, for long periods of time. And skeptics, of course, say that they will bargain forever until we're exhausted. Um, but is it your sense that, that you know, they've got their eyes on the prize and they, they really do want to get out from under sanctions and want to, uh, uh, want to get this deal? I think there were a lot of people who did not expect that they could get the kind of consensus in Tehran to do the first step agreement that we negotiated in November of 2013. That's an agreement that imposed some pretty significant constraints on the Iranian program. It halted its advance. It rolled it back in key respects. It's got transparency measures that include daily inspector access at some of its nuclear facilities. I mean, those are big steps. And they were signed off on by the powers that be in Tehran. So they were able to overcome the complexity in their government to do that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a step beyond that to get to a comprehensive mm -hmm. agreement. And a lot of what I think you can expect to see in terms of the negotiation isn't necessarily going to be negotiation across the table between the P5 plus 1 and Iran, but rather negotiation within Tehran as they try to come to uh, final terms with, um, with what the outcome of this negotiation will be. The other thing that I would say is, when we entered the first step agreement, uh, we had in mind this concept that you could end up in a perpetual negotiation. And we wanted to avoid that outcome. That was the fundamental logic of the joint plan of action. How do you ensure that these aren't just talks for the sake of talks? So the whole design of that agreement was to halt the advance of the Iranian nuclear program so that as we are talking, they can't be adding new centrifuges bringing their heavy water reactor online, moving forward in any kind of decisive way. And so that gives us the time and space to actually go through this incredibly complicated, difficult technical negotiation without having the central concern that this is all just uh, cover for bringing the program forward. And that what the International Atomic Energy Agency has told us is that every month that this interim agreement has been in place, Iran has been complying, and their program has remained essentially where it was in November of 2013. Mm -hmm. So um, we've talked about their parallel governments. Uh, ours uh, isn't exactly as unified as we would like either. Um, do you think that um, you know, uh, good sense will prevail on the Hill and the, the executive branch will get enough uh, room to, uh, uh, to carry these negotiations to their conclusion because there is uh, an enormous amount of um, antsiness, uh, for lack of a better word, on Capitol Hill uh, about this and um, you know, the domestic politics are incredibly complicated. So the case we've got to be able to make to the Hill is a pretty simple one. It's that each of the four pathways that Iran would have to get to a nuclear weapon – 
through its facility at Natanz, its underground facility at Fordo, its heavy water reactor, or through some covert path we don't know about, that all four of those pathways are effectively cut off. And I believe that the president will only sign off on a deal that results in that outcome. And then I think we will be able to make the case to Congress. And we will be able to convince them that we have effectively enhanced not only our security, but our partners' security in the region, and strengthened the nuclear nonproliferation regime. So I have confidence in our ability, if we reach an agreement, to be able to sell it. I'd just say two other things. The first is that the Congress takes a unique interest in this issue, in part because this has been a joint prog uh, project between the executive branch and the legislative branch. If you think about the construction of this sanctions regime over the last few years, it's been a combination of congressional legislation plus the building and sustainment of the most comprehensive coalition of countries ever to, to proceed in a, in a sanctions regime in history. And that's been the joint effort of Congress and the executive branch. So it's no surprise that they take a very deep and abiding interest in how this all plays out. And the administration has taken the position that we are going to be consulting, we are going to be working with them every step of the way as we go forward. And I think what you are seeing right now uh, is within the Congress a difference of opinion, and then between some members in the administration a difference of opinion over tactics at the moment. But at the fundamental level of what is our objective and what's our strategy for getting there, there's a fair degree of commonality between the Congress and the executive branch. Which um well, brings uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu to, to town, uh, who may not be uh, in, in that uh, small community of people who really want to achieve this deal. And, uh, you know, this is kind of an extraordinary thing that's going on. Um, and it's, he's now paying a domestic price for it, too, according at least to today's headlines in the New York Times. Um, but it's, um, it's unusual to have uh, a foreign leader essentially wade right into American domestic politics in this way. Um, obviously, it's an existential <laughs> issue for the Israelis. But I guess the question is, do we, can we get from here to a, uh, a deal without uh, doing uh, serious harm to that relationship? So uh, one of the benefits of being in New Haven rather than Washington <laughs> is that you miss out on the toing and froing that, that has gone on on this issue. And I must confess, I don't fully understand either his calculation with respect right. to this speech through the joint session or all of the dynamics that lie behind it. Uh, but I will say that as the United States looks at solving the Iranian nuclear issue, there's a number of different elements to it. One of them is to make sure that we don't end up with an arms race in the Middle East. Another one is to protect our own security, the security of our European allies, security of our Gulf partners. And another is to protect and enhance Israel's security. We have that very much in mind as one of a number of factors at play in trying to resolve the Iranian nuclear issue. If it turns out that uh, there is a difference of technical opinion between the US and, and Israeli experts, on what it actually takes to put the Iranian nuclear program in a box, then I'd be very worried. But I actually think that we've had incredibly good technical cooperation with them. We do have a common picture of what the program looks like and what it's going to take to sufficiently uh, put it in that box. Um, after that, it, it, the, the, the decisions made by political leaders, that's really up to them. As a negotiator, what I can focus on is making sure that when we make certain requests of the Iranian side, that all of our partners understand the scientific, technical, and strategic basis behind those requests. And I think that that has been basically the case with respect to our consultations with Israel over the last year and a half. And that's really been my main area of focus. One of the uh, unsung stories of these negotiations is how well um, the P5 plus one, the US and its and its key allies have uh, held together. Now, there have been times when it looked like the Russians were going to uh, fall off the wagon. Uh, but uh, certainly, the, um, the relationship between uh, the United States and its European partners has been unusually good here. And I think belies the, you know, the general narrative that the alliance is always uh, in a state of falling apart, and the, Euro the Europeans are always uh, underperforming. Um, do you think that that's going to, first of all, do you agree with that? Second of all, do you think that's going to continue until the end? Do we have the kind of 
um, uh, unity that is needed here? Look, I think this pretty unprecedented coalition is basically a testament to two things. One is just how much consensus there is among the major nations of the world that the Iranian nuclear program is a major problem. So countries are coming at this from their own self-interest. The Chinese and the Russians and the Europeans no more want to see a nuclear-armed Iran than the United States does. So that is one fundamental predicate in all of this. But the second is that the United States has made this a high priority in its bilateral dealings with each of these countries. And it, is, it has had robust and extensive diplomacy. I traveled with Hillary Clinton to all of the countries at the P5 plus one as we were building the sanctions architecture. And I was there when she made the presentations with great vigor about just how important this was to the United States. And I think countries have responded to that. With Europe, the steps that they have taken, we talk a lot about our sanctions, but the sanctions the Europeans have put in place, including a complete ban on Iranian oil to Europe, that is a big piece of business for 28 countries who can't agree on a whole lot a lot of the time to all come together and go that far, not to mention the financial sanctions and other sanctions. The Chinese being prepared to reduce their purchases. The Russians, even in the midst of all the difficulties that we have with them on other issues, and those difficulties are profound, working closely with the United States on solutions to various aspects of the Iranian nuclear program. It, it is something where I think people had predicted cracks or fissures in the coalition that have not appeared, and that has strengthened our hand at the negotiating table. So let's look at another area where the, uh, uh, the uh, Western alliance is being tested, and, and uh, where so far we've been holding together uh, well enough, and that is in dealing with uh, Russia over Ukraine. You know, I if, you look at, if you look at the uh, sort of uh, array of uh, uh, instruments on the table that, that we command and that others command, you would think, first of all, that we would have an overpowering hand. If keeping Russia from having access to international capital uh, is such an important thing, and yet you know, they don't have it now because of what they've done, and the possibility of even broader sanctions uh, really ought to uh, sober uh, the, the Kremlin. And yet at the same time, this is a conflict that keeps on going on. And so I guess the question is, uh, can you s envision a circumstance in which uh, Putin comes to his senses? Uh, or do we have to worry about cracks in our own uh, alliance before that happens? We've got to be vigilant about holding our alliance together. You know, sanctions always are going to generate some fatigue. And so continuing to press the case with our European partners that keeping the pressure on Putin is important, that's got to be a high priority. And Secretary Kerry knows that. The President knows that. When you look at a situation like Ukraine, it sort of points up um, both the opportunities and limitations of U.S. foreign policy. On the opportunity side, we could construct a coalition of countries to put massive economic pressure on Russia, combined with falling oil prices. And the Russian economy is feeling that acutely. We could add to that a strengthening of NATO, a strengthening of European energy security, tighter economic links with Europe, and all the other steps that we've taken as well as support directly to Ukraine. But at the end of the day, the limitation on that is that if Putin would rather choose backing uh, a bunch of basically, uh, for lack of a better term, thugs running around eastern Ukraine than maintaining some economic stability and a real prospect for Russian economic growth and vibrancy in the future, we can't at the end of the day, dictate that choice for him. All we can do is shape the playing field where we make that choice harder, more complicated, and we find ways to ensure that any aggression from Russia is constrained and suppressed to a maximum extent possible. But if Putin continues to push away all of his advisors who are telling him just how bad this is for Russia's future and continues to double down in Ukraine, then we have the set of steps we can take to respond to that. But it really is a decision he's going to have to make about what path he wants Russia to take on in the future. And if he chooses the path of confrontation and doubling down in Ukraine and other things, then our recipe is clear. It is continuing to reinforce the steps we've taken with respect to NATO, make sure that Russia can't use energy as a weapon against Europe, uh, strengthen our economic ties with Europe so that we help generate some more economic growth in Europe, and then look at all the other potential places where Russia could seek to destabilize things and try to shore them up, starting with the Baltics.
That's the recipe. I think that the president has done that quite effectively. And I don't think the fact that there is continued fighting in Ukraine means the policy is wrong or needs to be changed. I think what it means is that we just need to tighten the screws around every aspect of that so that Putin's choices become increasingly difficult and more complicated. But at the end of the day, Russia has certain capacities. And if he chooses to use them in eastern Ukraine, then there's only so much that we can do about it. Do you have a theory as to why he's pushed this through as far as he has? I think that he has himself outlined publicly a vision of Ukraine's role uh, in Russian history, his view of the end of the Cold War, uh, his view of wrongs that have been visited on his country by the West. And I think this amalgam of factors, going back to 91 and even before <coughs> that, has all contributed to this. I think one cannot underestimate the historic links between Russia and Ukraine and playing a role in this. And then, as with basically any foreign policy issue today, one cannot underestimate the role of domestic politics. Which he's manipulated to create this idea of a, uh, uh, of a traditional Russia, a Russia that's a guardian of, uh, of historic values and, and which is not, uh, shouldn't be uh, corrupted by westernization. So it does seem like he's chosen the horse he's going to ride. It's just a question of uh, you know, how hard he rides it into the wall, I guess. And, and look, we, the United States and our allies, uh, we need to be focused very much on supporting the government of Poroshenko, uh, President Poroshenko in Ukraine. We also need to be very focused on the long game. And in the long game, strengthening the fundamental foundations of the transatlantic alliance and making it clear to Russia that it is not going to be able to thrive while it carries out this objectionable behavior. Uh, those are, we have to be steadfast and disciplined in that. And I think at the end of the day, uh, Putin is going to end up having no choice. That may not be next month. It may not be the month after that. But at some point, the writing is going to be on the wall that Russia, this is not a path that is going to produce anything but problems for mm -hmm. Putin down the road. So does this uh, take us back to uh, the NATO of 1985, or um, um, is there another way to, you know, to deal with this without really reinvigorating uh, the transatlantic military tie and finally getting the Europeans to increase their military spending? I think we do need to get the Europeans to increase their military spending. I think every NATO partner should be sh uh, shouldering its share of the load, and that means getting up to 2% of their spending on, on uh, their militaries. I think equally, though, we need to think about how we strengthen Europeans' long-term economic prospects. Right. Because that, more than anything, uh, is the way that the United States and Europe together show the world that there is a better way to do things. And the current economic travails in Europe I think are not just an economic liability, they're a strategic problem. And uh, to the maximum extent possible, the United States needs to be focused on how we help Europe generate the kind of growth um, uh, and dynamism in their economies that has been lacking these last few years. So let me guess, you support the transatlantic free trade agreement. Well, I think <laughs> I, I support increased uh, trade and investment between the United States and Europe. I do think any particular trade agreement, how it's designed, really matters. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's got to benefit American workers and businesses. Uh, it's got to be a level playing field. It's got to set rules for the 21st century that we then begin to project out onto the rest of the global trading system. Uh, so I can't say definitively that the agreement that's being designed is exactly the one that I would want. But what I do want is tighter links between the US and Europe, because I think that's in not just our economic interest, but in our strategic interest. Well, let's turn to another thing that's driving us uh, uh, closer and strengthening those uh, bonds, which is uh, the rise of ISIS. Uh, you were there uh, in the summer of uh, 2014. I guess you left in August, correct? So you uh, were still in government when Mosul fell, and you saw the reaction. And um, I guess my, my first question to you is, um, you know, it, was, it came as quite a big shock to the, to the public. On the other hand, uh, those who'd been watching had, had noticed that ISIS had been growing stronger for quite some time. Um, do you think that the public uh, reaction 
uh, was outsized compared with uh, perhaps the understanding inside government, or uh, is this the really big deal that it's been uh, it's been portrayed as? You know, it's an interesting thing about imagery in foreign policy. Um, I think that the constant loop of the convoys coming directly into the television screen left the impression for many people in the United States that they were literally coming down the street. That like if you opened your door, there would be that convoy coming right at you. So I do think that people lost a little bit of geographic orientation in this. Um, and, and so the level of concern and worry about just how direct and imminent a threat ISIS posed to the United States was maybe not entirely matched to the reality. And I think a lot of that just had to do with a loop of cable news. That being said, I think the American people have a pretty good intuition when there's a force out there in the world that really needs to be contended with because it does represent a real threat. And in that respect, I think uh, thinking long term about how we deal with this issue of violent jihadism um, is something that is going to be a preoccupation for the rest of this president's term and the next president and probably the president after that. It is a really important issue. And the problem is that it tends to get put into a question of how many troops or military assets are we going to deploy to a particular place without sufficient focus on what are the underlying drivers of it, what are the dynamics in terms of the way that the, this region is governed? What are the historical forces at play here and how can they be responded to? How do we reclaim the communication space? Um, I say all these things mindful of the fact that you know, when you were in government, this was the argument that you were making long before there was an ISIS out there in the public consciousness, this kind of notion of making counterterrorism a more strategic project than we've made it. I think that should be the real lesson of ISIS. And that is going to take a learning curve on the part of not just our government, but the American people as well in terms of where we put our investments. Well, there's also a, a structural problem that we've all encountered, which is that the, the long-term programs that you need to deal with violent extremism, the ones that affect governance, rule of law, culture, things like that, uh, not a lot of interest on the Hill uh, in pursuing those because they will uh, yield results, if ever, uh, well beyond the careers of any of the people who are currently in office. And I haven't quite figured out how we're going to uh, get past that paradox. And you know, if you look, you know, the president gave a big speech last year about uh, right. working with partners and building partnership capacity, which was, of course, a major uh, initiative uh, uh, of the secretary that we both served, and yet um, uh, Congress has gutted that bill and basically said, okay, here's a couple billion for the Department of Defense and state you get nothing and uh, off you go. I mean, how do we get out of this one? It seems like you could um, produce all the public education you want and you're still not going to get the right outcome. Yeah. Look, I think there are two interrelated problems here. One of them is, as you point out, making long-term investments in an annual appropriations process that has heavy political overtones is very difficult because it can always be the first thing on the chopping block. The second is, and I saw this a lot in government, the room for error for a given uh, program that you put money into has become increasingly small. In the, interestingly, it can be huge. Like We can fund things for years and years, and they do nothing, but it stays on the books. But you might fund something that's fundamentally effective, but you find one person in that program who you know, shows up on a, a jihadi chat site or one person who you know, says the wrong thing in the wrong place, and all of a sudden, it's all canceled. Yeah. And so there is a level of risk aversion about putting money into this issue that uh, I think is ultimately to the detriment of, of US foreign policy and national security. And when you put those two things together, it means that programs designed to counter violent extremism tend to be both lightly funded and pretty milquetoast. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's interesting that people use the analogy of fighting with one hand tied behind your back if you're using um, uh, non-military means and not using the military means. Everyone will say, oh, you're holding yourself back. But people don't tend to do that in the reverse. If you're out there bombing somebody but you're not spending money on, on the kinds of programming and partner capacity building that we're talking about, you know, nobody really comes after you. No one questions your manhood or your womanhood for that. So 
it's a big challenge. Um, and I think the solution has to be finding a bipartisan focus across the major national security committees on the Hill um, with the White House participation that basically says, we are going to have an initiative uh, <laughs> along the lines of the sorts of things you were talking about back in the State Department with multiple lines of effort. One of those lines is necessarily going to be military. One of them is going to be building partner capacity. One of them is going to be programming to counter violent extremism. And one of them is going to be about strategic communications so that uh, we can elevate the voices of those who push back against this kind of nonsense and filth that we're seeing from the jihadists. That prescription ought to be achievable. And I actually think there is leadership on both sides in the Congress if we can get systematic about how we pull it all together. OK, so I'm going to push you on that one. Bipartisan agreement? Um, so where are, we, where are we seeing a lot of bipartisan agreement these days? And uh, when might we see it again? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it is, it is interesting that um, uh, certainly on the domestic side, it's, it's hard to identify areas of real bipartisan agreement. But um, in the aftermath of ISIS, the uh, Republicans and Democrats came together to pretty quickly pass a bill that had previously been totally bottled up on um, arming and training for the Syrian opposition. Now, one can question whether that policy makes sense or should have been accompanied by other things, but it does teach us a lesson, which is that in moments of crisis, especially national security crisis, there still is the wherewithal, not just for the parties to come together, but to do it quickly, uh, to, to move a bill fairly quickly. And so I have not given up the ghost on the idea that in this space, particularly on an issue like this, you couldn't get uh, you couldn't build a kind of bipartisan consensus to move something forward. I just have to say that after um, you know the time we spent uh, in the in, in the first Obama term uh, working on on these issues, I came away concerned that we have s that that the issue of counterterrorism and our engagement in the Middle East is so highly politicized. Um, whether it's because of the issue of uh, surprise and who was responsible for it in terms of 9-11, the incredible debate that we had, really vitriolic debate over Iraq, the sense of bitterness that it caused. And if you look at our European partners who uh, have sometimes seem to have their head in the sands, when they actually do get to recognizing the threat, it seems like they come together and they, and they act, um, whereas we are still fighting. I mean, obviously, parliamentary democracy has a lot of advantages in this way. But um, it is astonishing to me how, um, how divided we still are on how to deal with this threat, how, um, how deeply for many people it's a metaphysical issue and not a strategic one, that it's about a fundamental confrontation between uh, you know, Judeo-Christian society, civilization, and Islam. Um, I'd like to have your optimism. Tell me why I should have it. Uh, so, <laughs> look, I actually think the story of our involvement in the Middle East over the last 10 years, particularly where it comes to any kind of deployment of American military power, is not entirely a story about Republican versus Democrat. It is more a story about an American public that is tired of war, very skeptical about the use of American military force in this part of the world. And so if you take an issue like the Syria chemical weapons debate and um, the effort by the president to get authorization from Congress. You had bipartisan leadership in the Congress stand up and support the president on that bill. And then for two weeks, you had people back home on recess in town halls day in and day out getting beat up by people saying, why are we going to do this? Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. And you know. The, the concern, nervousness, skepticism about it was pretty bipartisan. But Boehner and Pelosi came together to the White House and went out front and stood together to say, we support the president on this. So I actually believe that there remains a reservoir uh, on this issue, on the issue of national security. If a president makes the case that says, I need this to respond to a particular threat, and I think the, the arming the Syrian rebels was an example of that, and I think that Boehner Pelosi's support on, on chemical weapons was an example of that. I think this is a bigger question about 
how the American public conceives of the role of the United States in a region where they have felt that our participation, our intervention, our involvement has been unsatisfying at best. That's a big challenge. But I, I just, I, I don't think uh, it is beyond the reach of the White House and the leadership of the National Security Committees uh, on the types of things we're talking about, which don't themselves kind of have a particular partisan edge to them, to come together uh, and, and figure out how to do a pretty substantial package. Not saying it will be easy, but, um, but I, I've seen enough of the areas where bipartisanship is still possible to believe that this, this can be carried out. So I think one of the things that our ad adventure or misadventure in the region has, has suggested is that there are um, problems that uh, may not have solutions and that there are uh, conflicts in which, believe it or not, we're not at the heart of things. So uh, one of the arguments I've been making is that um, the conflict between Sunni and Shia in the region, which has been going on you know, starting with the Iranian Revolution, is really what is driving a lot of uh, the violence that we see in Iraq and Syria and now, of course, in Yemen. And yet it seems that somehow in, in um, sort of the political arena, it's still largely about us and the threat to us and what we, what we do about it. And similarly, you know, everyone's throwing up their hands and saying, what do we do in Syria? I mean, neither side is really looking terribly attractive. And um, it seems like this is a wavelength we don't have in, in our discourse about uh, international affairs. Like, maybe this just isn't where we should be and it's time for us to let uh, others uh, fight it out and, and let, let these different demons settle down. Um, is this a misperception? Uh, are we, uh, uh, because of our importance in the world, uh, essentially always uh, uh, bound to be involved in conflicts like this? So I'd add one other thing to um, you know, the, the challenge we face here, and that is I think there's a great deal of um, historical amnesia. There, there's a notion that once upon a time, the United States bestrode the Middle East like a colossus and just dictated events and said, you know, make this happen there and that happen there. And of course, you had a 15-year, very bloody civil war in Lebanon, even with the deployment of US Marines. You had this war between Iran and Iraq that uh, involved the use of chemical weapons. And you could go on down the list throughout our history. So we have never been able particularly to bring about and sustain stability in the Middle East, um, not in the present era and really not in any era along the way. That being said, I think it is a bit dangerous for us to, to ascribe to what's happening in the Middle East too much to these big forces, these nameless, faceless forces like Sunni versus Shia, uh, jihadist versus moderate. Because at the end of the day, a lot of the things that are happening in the Middle East are driven by state decision making. Iranian policy, mm -hmm. Saudi policy, Iraqi policy out of Baghdad. And that we do have the capacity to influence today. We have the capacity to cajole. We have the capa ca capacity to coerce. We have the capacity to institution build, to try to create uh, forums for de-escalation. Not saying it's easy, but I do think one of the things we end up looking at all this stuff happening within states and we sort of say, I'm not sure we can fix that. And I sort of agree, it's hard when it's at the level of local violence uh, between communities. But I think if you zoom out and say, instruments of state policy are driving a lot of this and we've got tools to influence that state policy, that should be the direction I think that we take our policy towards the Middle East over the next decade. So I want to ask you just uh, two more questions, and then we'll turn it over to the audience for Q&A. The first one uh, is also uh, relevant to this issue of whether some of these forces are too big for us or um, uh, whether we have the right idea at all right now, and that is, are we leaving Afghanistan too quickly? You mean fi militarily leaving yes. too quickly? Yes. Because I think it's important to note that we're talking about sustaining a multi billion dollar commitment annually going out several years from now, which is a huge investment mm -hmm. in that country. Um, I will be interested to see what actually happens at the beginning of 2017. The president's already made one adjustment to his timetable for the drawdown uh, related to the outcome of the election. 
And um, so, so we will have to see where things stand at the beginning of 2017. But I don't actually believe that we can subscribe to a notion of keeping troops in Afghanistan indefinitely. So there has to be some sense of how long it's going mm -hmm. to be. Now, I think we should take a look a year from now and ask ourselves, what is the state of play of the political situation in Kabul, the strength of the Afghan national security forces, and what lessons, frankly, can we draw out of Iraq and the situation in Iraq um, to tell us whether we need to make any adjustments. So I think it's too soon to tell. I don't put it out of the realm that the smartest move for the United States is to be out of Afghanistan at the beginning of 2017. Mm -hmm. I don't think that I would not write that off because at some point Afghanistan is going to have to step up uh, and do this on its own from a military perspective with support coming in from the outside uh, in terms of funding and economic support. Um, so. I think we have to watch this unfold over the course of the next year. Although if the Taliban starts making real advances, we'll have many second, third, and fourth thoughts about, about the policy, I'm sure. Yeah, but you have to ask yourself, what are the implications of saying that the metric for American forces remaining in Afghanistan is as long as there is any instability or threat there, American forces remain? The implication of that is a permanent presence mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. Then you have to ask the question, is in the sweep of the world and all of the issues we need to be grappling with right now, that the best allocation of resources. I believe that we have a commitment to the Afghan people and that we need to do a lot of things to fulfill that commitment. But a permanent presence of American troops in Afghanistan, in my view, is not one of them. So then it just becomes a question of what's a timetable that creates the best possibility, the best opportunity with no guarantee that Afghanistan can succeed. So my last question, at least for now, um, do you think that in the public debate we are uh, focused, by and large, on the right issues? Or do small issues take outsized um, importance? You know, one of the things you don't read about too much in the daily papers is the South China Sea. Right. But you read an awful lot about every single decapitation in uh, Iraq. Uh, the uh, discussion of uh, you know getting a, an agreement between Israelis and Palestinians, you know we could swim in those seas of ink, um, uh, but you know there are things going on in you know the in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, in any number of other places that are consuming lives, uh, you know at a ma many many magnitudes uh, orders of magnitude greater. So I guess I'd be uh, curious if after your, uh, your six years in Washington, you think that we as a nation uh, are, are focusing on the right things. I mean, just look at what happened when uh, 17 people were killed in France, admittedly a tragedy, compared to you know, hundreds upon hundreds every day, it seems, in Nigeria, anyway. Yeah, I, I do think we... Uh, in terms of the news media's focus and attention on issues were out of whack. Yeah. I mean, there is a uh, unbelievable focus and elevation in priority of everything in the Middle East compared with the rest of the world. Uh, Putin is a good competitor uh, to the Middle East for the fascination of the news media because he's such an interesting character from their perspective. Right. But you look at a lot of other just unbelievable dynamics and you wonder why is this not getting more play. You mentioned the South China Sea. In the East China Sea, over the past two years, you've had Chinese and Japanese vessels operating in incredibly cr close proximity to one another, fighter jets buzzing one another overhead. This is the second and third largest economy in the world, literally at loggerheads a few hundred yards apart on the open ocean and in the skies. The United States has gone out, the President of the United States has said publicly in Tokyo that Article 5 of our defense treaty with Japan would apply if there was a fight over the Senkakus, meaning that if China and Japan start fighting, we're in. I mean, that's astonishing. Yeah. Now, things have hopefully calmed down to a certain extent because President Xi and Prime Minister Abe recently met in Beijing, probably not something anybody learned about here. That was big because it has reduced the risk of conflict that could not only tank the global economy, but really drag the US in. I don't mean to scare scaremonger on this thing. I think it is manageable. I think we are working hard at it. And, and 
beyond the headlines, U.S. foreign policy has been quite focused on the Asia Pacific. But that's an entire region that when the president goes on a trip there, the White House press corps discovers all of these very large countries and economies that are, you know, making a difference in the world, and then comes back to the relatively small number of foreign policy issues that dominate the daily, the daily discourse. So I think we've got a big issue on that. Honestly, I don't know what the remedy is for it, so all I can do is sit here and admire the problem. Well, clearly Dartmouth has to have an executive education program for journalists. <laughs> um, so anyway, with that, um, why don't I open it up to the floor and um, please wait for the mic and uh, just ensure that there is a question mark at the end of your, uh, of your statement. Please wait for the mic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, going back to the uh, opening, uh, opening here, we're dealing with Iran. Uh, there was mention of both the constitutional and the religious elements within Iran. Uh, there is the third element of the Revolutionary Guards. And uh, I was curious as to your thoughts on uh, how much uh, I impact they, they have. Their spokesmen have been making a lot of noise against any kind of, uh, of, uh, of a deal uh, uh, with, uh, uh, against any kind of a, a diminution of, their, uh, of the atom bomb, but uh, uh, just as them as a fairly major third player. Right. So we have uh, designated the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps multiple times in multiple ways place sanctions on them and their various dealings. And they are engaged in a variety of incredibly troubling activities across the region, destabilizing other countries, shipping weapons uh, to our militant groups, you know, even actively participating in certain conflicts in certain places. And it has been a major focus of ours in the region, working with our partners to push back hard from an intelligence and other perspective against that. It is hard to divine what exactly their perspective is on the nuclear issue. Uh, obviously, um, whether they supported or opposed it, uh, the joint plan of action was agreed and adopted in Tehran. The leader has made clear publicly that uh, he is um, backing his negotiators and having them continue in this. But I do not doubt for a minute that there are voices in Tehran, uh, some of them probably in the IRGC, who uh, have an entirely different vision for how they want the region to look, uh, for Iran's role in it to look, than even Minister Zarif and his team of negotiators, let alone what our vision is, which is, of course, a, a completely uh, different point of view from theirs. So I'm mindful of the fact that um, this is a country that has uh, various power centers, that some of those power centers have engaged in incredibly pernicious behavior and activity, and that uh, we need to think about how all of these issues fit together if there is no agreement or if there is an agreement and what comes after because all is not sunshine and roses between the United States and Iran if there's an agreement on the nuclear file. We still have profound differences with them on sponsorship of terrorism, human rights, and other things. So to think about the Iranian nuclear ne negotiations, although we try to keep it in its own lane, you, you also have to conceive of the broader context at play and the IRGC is an important part of that context. I had another uh, quick question about the Iran uh, nuclear negotiations. Um, my first very quick question is how much nuclear physics do you have to learn in order to, to actually understand the technology well enough to do yeah. this? Um, and I'm a physics professor. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the, uh, my second question is, you mentioned there were four pathways by which they could achieve a weapon, three of which were already established facilities that I imagine it's easy to understand their capability and yeah. you could really think about how to keep them under in a box, as you said. But the fourth one was covert mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, activity that you wouldn't even necessarily know about. And I'm curious, uh, how do you assess that threat at all if it's covert? So. Um, I guess that's two quick questions. Yeah. It's a great question that keeps me up at night, the second one. The first one kind of keeps me up at night, too, the, uh, the question about nuclear physics. Um, the second one, definitely. Uh, so our team 
consists of experts from uh, the State Department who have a long history in, in nuclear negotiations who are themselves technical experts, and from the Department of Energy who are, um, have written a book uh, to a certain extent on, on this set of issues. And I would not substitute my judgment for them, but uh, the short answer is that I have had to learn an incredible amount about how heavy water technology works, how uh, centrifuge technology works, how to think about um, uh, stockpiles and what happens when you turn it into oxide form and what happens when you turn it into fuel plates and so forth and what is the entire fuel fabrication cycle. Uh, I, I have had to learn all of that uh, just from to, to cross a basic threshold as we go through these discussions. But you should rest assured that, that the technical knowledge needed to uh, carry out a successful negotiation is not <coughs> entirely lodged in my head, that there are um, true experts, people who know this stuff backwards and forwards who are part of it. But it has been, that has been a big part of my education over the last two years, is, is really to understand um, the nature of the Iranian program. And in part, that's been about then knowing what arguments they're making with respect to the purported civilian aspects of their program are credible and what are bunk, for example. Uh, and having been able to develop that knowledge, I think, has been an asset at, at the table. But having the people behind us who really know this stuff is an even more important asset. On the issue of the covert path, this is, this is a, a huge question, right? How do you deal with a circumstance in which a country is seeking to build a nuclear bomb at a place and through a means that you know nothing about? There is really only one way to reduce to as close to zero as possible the prospect that they are doing that, and that is through uh, a massive increase in transparency and verification measures that allow the International Atomic Energy Agency to be able to look in every aspect of the program and beyond, um, and then to take the combined means of the world and through the IAEA be able to say, we have suspicions about this place here. We'd like to go. We, we've got a report that maybe something untoward is happening there. We've got to go. And to know with confidence that that kind of access will be granted. That has two dimensions to it. One is it increases the possibility that you may actually discover if something untoward is happening. The second is that you increase the deterrence that that activity is undertaken in the first place because the fear of getting caught goes up. But that's not foolproof. However, I would submit to you this. If you think about the options available to a country, to the United States or any other country, to deal with someone who's trying to pursue a nuclear weapon through a covert path, think about the other options besides a negotiated agreement where you get all of that transparency. One of them is you keep sanctioning them until they give everything up, but how do you know if they gave up this? Another is to engage in military action, but obviously you're not going to strike a site you don't know about. So, this problem is not a problem of negotiations. It's the original kind of core problem of, the, of dealing with the Iranian nuclear issue in the first instance. And that is why driving so hard for a, an outcome um, through the negotiations, I believe, is such an important thing for us. I would just add one last point. Most of the public debate on the Iran nuclear program is about centrifuges and the declared facilities. What's going to happen with them? You know, how are they going to be dealt with? People are not as focused on these highly technical details that are required to increase our level of confidence on the verification side. But when I sit down and I think about what's the thing I absolutely must get right, that is number one on my list. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming to Dartmouth, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, I had two quick questions, uh, just kind of like going a little bit north to Russia. Um, the first is you said that we need to focus on our long game, uh, and that would be strengthening our relationship with Europe and also Europe economically in general. Um, my question then is uh, what constitutes Europe? Uh, you said that we should you know, keep pursuing uh, uh, 
we should keep supporting Poroshenko, but should we also extend that to Belarus and uh, um, the Baltics? Or should we let Russia kind of like carve out sort of its sphere of influence there and then focus on the core EU? And then I guess I would also go for the Caucasus. And then the second question is, how much do you think uh, like this idea of pan-Eurasianism and like ideological obstinacy to the West affects Putin's calculus? Or do you think that at some point within the next five or 10 years, he would bow to um, just the, re the financial and economic realities of this situation? So uh, with respect to the first question, I think we have a core obligation to NATO, an Article 5 commitment, and that's an ironclad commitment. And that is a military commitment, including to the Baltics. Uh, the three Baltic states. And that means that we should be forward deploying more forces there, uh, both air and ground forces. Uh, and we have done that over the past few months. I think we should continue that. So that is, when I talk about Europe, one aspect of it is the Article 5 commitment to NATO. But it doesn't stop there, because there are a number of countries that are not in NATO and that are not in the European Union that would like to join the, Euro, the path of Euro-Atlantic integration. And I think we should do everything in our power to support them in that. That includes countries in the Balkans. It includes countries in the Caucasus. It includes countries like Moldova. And what that means is that you know, helping those countries deal with their challenges to strengthen their economies and their democratic path so that they can be uh, part of a Euro-Atlantic community, that should be a huge priority of ours. One thing that worries me. Uh, about the Russian approach to foreign policy in the region is the use of corruption as a foreign policy tool. The, the, you know, the hollowing out of institutions. We've seen what, what has resulted from Ukraine. And there are concerns, I think, in other parts of Europe about the role of uh, dark money and oligarchs and so forth. And so one of the things that we need to think about is how do you strengthen governance and anti-corruption efforts, not just as like social work in the region, but as real national security work to help uh, create a bulwark against further efforts by Russia to destabilize some of these countries in the region. We categorically reject the idea of spheres of influence anywhere uh, in any part of the world. Now, Belarus is a special case in some ways because, in, in terms of US foreign policy, because it is not a country that has evinced any meaningful willingness to join the path of Euro-Atlantic integration. It has chosen a totally different path. Um, and so I think our policy towards Belarus stands apart from our policy towards much of the rest of the region. On the question of whether Putin will come around, it is very hard to know. Uh, what is clear is that over the course of the 2000s, his views have certainly evolved. The Putin of 2002 has been different from the Putin of 2000. 10 different from the, the Putin of 2015. You would not have had a reset and the steps that were taken in the early years of the Obama administration without Putin's blessing. So he believed in some degree of pragmatic cooperation with the West. There was a window of pragmatic cooperation after 9-11 as well. Uh, so I don't know that there's anything absolutely fixed and fundamental in terms of his view, but it certainly seems that an overall project uh, that is rooted in a narrative about um, Russia being put down before and needing to reassert itself now does lie at the core of the steps that he's going to take. All that we can do is try to put pressure on him to make the right choices and then offer him the opportunity to choose a different path. Not just push him in a corner and tell him he's got to stand there, but offer him an opportunity a different path. A different path would mean a negotiated outcome in Ukraine, and an opportunity for Russia to participate meaningfully in the, uh, you know, the significant decisions of the international system, which a country of its size and stature, it ought to, but it's got to meet some basic thresholds of good behavior for us to really feel like, for example, um, you know, it, it deserves a seat at the G8. So, I think we've got to be flexible and open and basically consistently communicating at all levels to Putin. We're not trying to create a new Cold War here. You know, there is a different way forward, but you're going to have to make some fundamental choices on it. Whether he will or won't, I think, is very difficult to tell. And there's good reason to believe that if he does, it will still take a long time for him to do so. Two quick questions to follow that up. One, 
uh, should we uh, <coughs> should we give arms to Ukraine? And two, how do you respond to those who say that it's the United States that reneged on its promise to Russia uh, from you know the period of NATO enlargement? So uh, on the this is a, a right, the second question first. A long-standing Russian complaint is that there was some promise to Russia that we would not, in fact, enlarge NATO up to Russia's border. U.S. officials claim that that promise was never given. I mean, I wasn't there at the time. All I can say is that it ought to be a pretty unassailable principle that countries get to choose their own affiliations. So if the Baltic states want to join NATO, so be it. If the Baltic states wanted instead to join the Eurasian Customs Union with Russia, so be it. So. From my perspective, there isn't some kind of, you know, we don't live in an era where the United States and Russia sit and carve up Europe and decide who goes with who. Countries get to make their own decisions. That's how I'd respond to, to that Russian complaint. What was said in the room and what promises were made, that I can't really speak to. With respect to arming the, uh, providing arms to Ukraine, my instinct is to say that I would support doing some of that, as, especially in light of these most recent awful offensives that we've seen in the last few days. But this whole question of providing arms is a very complicated one that raises a lot of questions about how effective it's going to be, what are the, the, the knock-on effects, how is Russia going to respond. And it is hard for me sitting on the outside now to come up with a definitive analysis of that. One of the things that has bothered me about the commentary around arming, whether in Syria or on this, is people who aren't there dealing with all the enormous complexities of those decisions draw very easy conclusions when I think these questions are incredibly difficult. So my instinct is probably, but I can't say that definitively. Chad. Piggybacking on the NATO <coughs> comments on the expansion of NATO, um, has the U.S. made major mistakes with NATO by engaging nations on Russia's border? Um, mainly, you mentioned that the U.S. public isn't very, um, is more averse to war currently. And by engaging those countries and allowing them to join NATO, are we making obligations that we're not going to be able to upkeep? Will the U.S. actually go to war for a country like Ukraine or Belarus with Russia? Um, well, how do you see that? so neither Ukraine nor Belarus is in NATO at the moment. Um, but the three Baltic states which border Russia are, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Um, Poland borders Russia at Kaliningrad and is in NATO. Um, my basic take on this is if those countries were not in NATO, you look at a country like Latvia, which has a very sizable Russian minority population, you could easily see the same thing that's happening in Ukraine happen in Latvia. I think the fact that they are bound to the Western alliance system, the fact that there is a Baltic air policing mission and now rotational deployments of U.S. service members in those countries is a testament to U.S. commitment to supporting free market democracies in Europe. And does it create more challenges because they're right on Russia's border? It does. But what is the alternative to say, well, good luck? And so my view is that when the president goes to the Baltics, and the vice president goes to the Baltics, and they assert with conviction that Article 5 means what it says and that we have an ironclad commitment, we will follow through on that. And I think our NATO allies have watched the response to Ukraine and have some confidence in the way that, that we have, have done this. Look, all of this talk is sort of dispiriting in some ways because 20 years or more after the end of the Cold War, um, it would be so much more profoundly in Russia's interest to choose a different path forward where you didn't end up with these confrontation questions about are you going to go to war over Latvia and the like. Uh, Mr. Putin has decided to go a different path right now, but I just go back to my original comments in saying the thrust of U.S. policy has to be to make the better decision attractive and open to him, and the worst decision we have to impose costs and sharpen the choice for him. And that has to be the continuing underlying principle of U.S. policy towards Russia in the years ahead. Professor Valentino. Uh, 
I just wanted to ask you, uh, partly following on, on your answer to the last question, but you brought it up earlier, too, when you mentioned the South China Sea Island disputes, that the United States has committed itself quite publicly and openly to the defense of, um, of these islands in the case there's a conflict with Japan and China. And then in the previous answer, you said, look, what would have happened to the Baltics if we didn't have uh, a NATO commitment? And I was thinking, well, yeah, you, that's a good argument about why the Baltics need NATO, and you made a good argument about why Japan needs its alliance with the United States. But I want to hear the, the other side. Why do we need to defend Japan over the, its conflict with China over some barren rocks? Why do we need to defend the, the Baltics? What's in it for the United States? It's, right, this is, we have to make hard-headed commitments about, I mean, of course, we already have made a commitment to those places, but I guess the earlier question is asking in some ways, was that a wise commitment since we now are, our reputation is now staked on the defense of those. Yeah. And you could expand this to a number, I mean, it sounds like you've worked all around the world in different places, a number of areas where the United States seems to have staked itself, its commitments, it's made uh, treaty arrangements with small places. And you just wonder, again, if we were starting from a blank slate today, if we didn't already have those alliances with the Baltics, if we didn't already have a commitment to Japan that we felt we had to extend to those islands, would we would we start again and do those things? What would be the argument? Why didn't we do it then? Um, why didn't when what happened to Ukraine happened to Ukraine? Why didn't we say we're you know okay we're going to start a new alliance with you? Mm -hmm. So what are what do you, is in your view what's America's stake in in some of these? seemingly at least small uh, places where we might end up in a war with the biggest powers uh, in the international system? Uh, it's a great question. I think there is a macro answer and a more micro answer. The macro answer is that the United States' basic thesis about global stability and prosperity is that the more free market democracies that are accountable to their people and that participate in an open international economic system the better for everybody. So that, that's the thesis. And as the, as the most powerful country in the world and the country that has the greatest stake in, in protecting, preserving, updating the international order, you think about, all right, what are the tools to advance that thesis? One of them is that if a country falls into that category, is a free market democracy that shares our values and shares our vision for the world and comes to us and says, all right, I'd, we'd like to be part of your alliance system. It's fundamentally in our interest to offer the incentive for that to happen. Now, the places you're most going to expect that are going to be places where there's a troubling <laughs> neighbor that they're worried about. So East Asia and Europe, you're going to see that probably less in Latin America because the countries there don't need to worry about an American security umbrella to the same extent. So that's kind of the macro answer. It's to say that the United States basically believes even in 2014, just as it did in 1945, that the proposition that free market democracies uh, generally enhance the overall stability of the world and therefore are worthy of protection and it's, it's a worthy thing to provide incentives for people to come into it. And the fact of, of NATO membership being an attractive force for countries in Europe to come into should not be forgotten from 20 years ago. I mean, countries worked to get into NATO in the 90s and 2000s. That's the macro answer. The more micro answer is that the conflict in Ukraine is not in our interest. I mean, having this kind of instability that could potentially spill over into other places as well is not in our interest. You could say that maybe less profoundly impacts the United States than some other things do, but imagine if China and Japan actually went to war with one another. Okay, that would be a huge problem from just a strictly economic point of view, let alone everything else. So what is the best way to de-escalate that situation? One could say, have the U.S. pull out of it and not really worry about it. But I, I think that probably would have increased the possibility of conflict. I think the fact that the United States came forward and asserted the Article 5 commitment actually created a circumstance where China realized that there was not going to be a military solution to this conflict. And that's how you end up with a Xi Abe meeting where you do. So in some ways, the US military commitment there creates more stability rather than less. And I would say the same thing with respect to the Baltics, that, that by making this commitment, in some ways, you reduce the chance that you get dragged into a conflict down the road by making the commitment firmly up front. Whether, I don't know about what other places you're talking about, I do think that there are questions about 
uh, that we should ask ourselves about whether we need to update our kind of overall conception of priorities and security arrangements and so forth. But I think with respect to NATO and Japan, the, uh, the underlying fundamental logic still obtains today. Right here. So I recently returned from an internship uh, during which I had access to classified information and from that I'm curious um, when there's a conclusion or a decision that's reached using classified information that may or may not be as well supported using unclassified information, how that's communicated to a broader audience. So I'll give you a great example of this. We, um, uh, when Assad gassed his own people uh, in the outskirts of Damascus, most of the information that we had linking the regime to that was initially classified information. So you've got to go make a case to the world that, no, first of all, that this happened, and second, that Assad did it. And we could go make presentations. We could get the information classified in a special way to be able to present it to foreign governments. But you also have to make the case in the court of public opinion. So how do you do that? You can't just say, well, we've got the intelligence that proves it, especially after 2003. Uh, so how do you do it? In the end, we ended up declassifying a fair amount of information. And what happens when you declassify information that relates to signals, intelligence, and the like is, of course, you put at risk sources and methods. But in that case, we had to make a fundamental choice. Do we enhance our credibility by showing people basically our homework, saying this, these are the actual elements we have to prove that this happened, uh, and thereby put a little bit at risk our sources and methods, or do we just say trust us at a time when you know, the use of weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East is not a subject on which our credibility is particularly high. Um, and we ended up doing some declassification for that reason. But in other contexts and other circumstances, a lot of what we have to rely on are robust presentations directly to governments where we have more latitude to share with them classified information that we can't share publicly. And uh, I think this is going to be an ongoing challenge as we go forward largely because some of the biggest threats that we face and some of the most um, acute challenges that are unfolding now have an attribution problem attached to them. It's hard to determine who did it. You know, you have the Sony North Korea thing where eventually they had to release more information that was probably initially classified. Uh, you have your Putin little green men problem in uh, Crimea where it's a bunch of guys and he says, oh, those aren't Russians, you know. So this whole issue of attribution suggests that we are going to have to get um, probably a little bit more risk acceptant when it comes to releasing classified information publicly in order to establish that we know who done it for a given thing that got done. Right here. Um, my question, really quick, is uh, regarding the reapproachment from the Indians that we have seen this week to the U.S. Um, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on what the this realignment of India seems to suggest for the prospect of security in in Asia and how the Chinese might react to this. So it's been a while now that uh, the United States and India by all the fundamentals, should be really natural partners. Diverse democracies, uh, incredibly innovative, dynamic people, um, uh, a sense of you know, destiny for both countries. We're really trying to get ahead in the 21st century. There's just a lot that, you know, and then obviously the millions of Indian Americans here, you would have thought we, we would see even more of a coalescence of the bonds between India and the United States faster than we had seen it, because all the fundamentals are there. Not to mention that uh, India has a stake both in South Asia, but also in East Asia and the Pacific for a rules-based order that um, uh, sort of has everybody, whether it's on trade or maritime or you name it, playing by the same rules and playing on a level playing field. 
So I think the big struggle in India has been uh, that they were the proud standard bearers for the non-aligned movement through the Cold War, and that they have embraced this concept called strategic autonomy. They are not going to be lashed to any other country. And the United States poses a unique problem in this regard, because even just a partnership with the US raises questions, are you the junior partner? Or, you know, are you just doing the US's bidding? So there's been this nervousness that's been slowly, slowly receding. I think what Modi has decided is that there is no contradiction between strategic partnership with the United States on the one hand and strategic autonomy on the other, that he can have both. And having made that decision, he can much more freely embrace uh, a common joint agenda. I think the Chinese probably look at it and think at least part of it's about them. Every country thinks things happening between other countries are partly about them. Uh, China is no exception to that. Uh, and you know, it's not like China is completely absent from the equation in the sense that thinking about the future of the Asia Pacific region requires in part thinking about how China's rise uh, is ultimately shaped by its own leaders and by all the other actors. And the US and India both have a profound stake in that happening the right way. What I don't think China should think, and what I think both the US and India need to avoid, is some sense that the US and India are conspiring against it. I think the president would go out of his way to, to insist that's not the case. But the US and India stating a kind of neutral set of principles and a vision for the region that includes asking certain things of China I think is perfectly appropriate, and that is the I think part of the thrust of the policy going forward. I think it's incredibly positive and exciting. Uh, and the the new U.S. ambassador to India is a very close friend of mine, a guy named Rich Verma, who's the first Indian American ambassador to India, uh, a young dynamic guy. And I think this he embodies the relationship itself, just the the real capacity for it to absolutely take off in the years ahead. Back. Uh, good afternoon. I was just curious if you could talk about uh, your thinking on how you make decisions. Um, it's obvious that you're very well versed in so many issues uh, associated with all these countries throughout the world. Uh, in terms of your effectiveness uh, in traveling with the secretary, you know, how do you view how you make decisions, what seems to be effective, uh, what seems to be uh, you know, a shortcoming? How do you think about that? Because it seems to me that everyone's pulling at your sleeve, asking you, well, Jake, what do you think? And so as you go through your decision cycle, um, you know, what seems to work? Is there a pattern recognition of sorts? And what seems to not work? You just have really good staff giving you talking points, yeah, right? Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> no, it's a great question. I, so it, government is this incredibly complex organism where any decision is reflecting the input of hundreds, if not thousands, of people. So in the purchase that I've had, one of the biggest things I've got to be able to do is talent identification, basically. Who's good and who can be trusted? Because you know I'm not an expert in every issue under the sun. So, And if there's a debate between two experts on Putin in answer to your question, one thinks he's going to do this, one thinks he's going to do that, I've got to make some judgment about not just what's more persuasive in like some neutral debate, but like what's real in the world and who's got a better grip on that. So that's one thing, is being able to um, establish over time a sense of who's been right and who's been insightful and so forth and who hasn't, who kind of screws up. So being very focused on that is one. A second thing is um, looking at the second and third and fourth order potential effects where you play everything out to a conclusion. If we do this, what are all the possible things that might happen? How would we respond? And then what are all the things that could happen? And being very disciplined about that so that you're not surprised at what comes right around the corner. And then a third thing is um, trying to push back against the options that are given to you. Because what ends up happening a lot of the time is someone will present three options. One option is do everything. One option is do nothing. And one option is 
do something. And it's like, well, among those three choices, do something is the only relevant option. So if you just stuck with the option set that was given to you, you'd end up picking the preferred option of that person, but not really the true span of options. So also being willing to step up and say, no, come back. I, I need three options in the do something category, because I'm not doing everything. I'm not doing nothing. So break that down for me. That's also an important feature in this. But the last thing is, honestly, you, I think it's having a, an enormous amount of humility in government, I think, is really important. Um, you know, I've said before that the government at the end of the day is nothing more than the sum total of the human beings that operate it. And you're talking about imperfect people with imperfect information and deeply imperfect choices in an imperfect process. So you're going to get imperfect results. And recognizing your own shortcomings in the areas where you need to defer to other people's judgment or you need to say to the secretary or the president, I think this is right, but I can't promise that it is because the following three things are out there. Being willing to step up and do that on a regular basis and, and having the confidence to do that I think is incredibly important. Um, and then, you know, you basically don't sleep the entire time you're in government because you basically just think you, you're constantly screwing up. Every night you go to sleep, you think, I've made some terrible mistake today. I'm not sure what it is, but I'm sure I did. And you, you stay up all night thinking about what it might have been, and you, ho you hope just to get to the next night so you can stay up all night again on some other set of issues. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's a huge challenge. Um, and one of the interesting things about the United States is that we have such a profound can-do spirit and a sense that we can go out and solve any problem in the world. And it's amazing. I mean, I've sat with the secretary while she has talked in a well-versed manner about caterpillar infestations in northern Liberia. You know, like what other country in the world gives a dang about caterpillar infestations in northern Liberia? The United States, we go around the world and we care and we want to solve problems. And, uh, the, the challenge is that most other countries approach foreign policy issues from a fundamentally different perspective. They have different historical hangups. They have different narratives. They have different calculations. And oftentimes, in our exuberance and our enthusiasm, we try to blow past all that. And I think that's where we tend to make our mistakes, is where we don't sufficiently take on board or into account the fact that most other peoples and countries are kind of constitutionally designed, I don't mean like um, legally wise, but like in their own, in their sort of national sensibilities are built differently than the United States of America is built. Well, actually, I'm going to um, abuse the prerogative of the chair then and ask the last question, which takes off directly from what you just said. I was reading, Jake gave a, uh, a commencement speech at, at uh, the University of Minnesota. Um, where he was uh, visiting another former colleague, and uh, it, it was a, it's a fabulous speech, and I commend it to you, all of you, and you can find it if you Google it. And um, you had to uh, uh, deal with the remarkable genre of the commencement speech. Right. Um, but uh, particularly for those in the audience who are looking forward to uh, careers in, in public service, you, uh, you offered uh, three simple propositions. One, reject cynicism reject certitude, and don't be a jerk. And um, I think it's pretty good. I mean, I once told my kids that you know all of life was about not being a pig and not thinking everything was a competition, but I like that too. Um, do you want to um, add any comments on that? The, uh, um, I think they're all pretty good, uh, pretty good recommendations. Yeah, I mean, just briefly on each of them. I mean, the first is, especially if you're a young person in government, there's an incentive to say no to everything. Uh, Kurt Campbell, who was a colleague of ours, um, uh, gave a talk recently. He's the Assistant Secretary for East Asia. He said something very funny that has stuck with me. He said, look, some people enter government and they think the best way to rise to be Assistant Secretary or Deputy Secretary is just to learn one sentence. All you need is just one sentence. You just need to be able to deliver it well. And the sentence is, I don't think that's a very good idea. 
<laughs> and if you just keep saying that over and over again, people say, wow, that's a smart person. They've got good <laughs> judgment. And you just keep getting promoted. Yeah. You don't. Now, there is some of that in Washington. Not, not as much as you might think, but there is some of that. But there is a tendency for people to say instinctively no to things. And when I say reject cynicism, I think being prepared to withstand people saying no to you persistently and say, no, let's try it a different way. Let's see. Don't listen to this guy telling you that we can't have bipartisan agreement on counterterrorism. <laughs> Heck yeah, we can. You know? Uh, you know, my favorite no, I said in the speech, my favorite no is the combination no. It's when you go into somebody and you say, how about we do this? And they say, this is the combination no. Um, that'll never work, and we're already doing it. Yeah. <laughs> you hear that a lot. That's <laughs> not great. So that's on the cynicism front. On the certitude front, I was talking about imperfection. And what I find interesting is that um, any argument that you make in the imperfect world that I just described of choices and information is by definition going to have weaknesses and is going to have shortcomings. And you've got to be able to acknowledge them. And any argument on the other side, if it's not completely outlandish and frivolous, and most aren't, is going to have some good points in it. And you've got to be able to acknowledge those too. Because if you can't do that, then you're just, yes, you can, you can score the points and whatever, but you're not actually going to make effective policy. And that's what I mean by rejecting certitude. I think it's just so important that people be open to arguments. And you know, working on this Iran issue has been a great lesson for me on this, because people have strong views on both sides. There are people I respect greatly who think that I am making mistakes, big mistakes. You know? And I don't say, no, you're an idiot, you're wrong. I say, tell me more, you know, what, and let me think that through. And do I need to make an adjustment? Being able to do that in Washington, I think, makes you so much more profoundly effective. On the don't be a jerk thing, it is amazing to me how uh, you know, those people who kind of connive and scheme and are just in it for themselves, they do get ahead for a while, but there is a ceiling on them, by and large. Not in all cases, but in most cases. There's all, they can only go so far. They get found out after a fashion. And people have a sixth sense about whether you're in it to be on the team and you're there for the mission and so forth. And people want to work with you if you are. Uh, even in Washington, even in a place that gets really derided, I find this to be the case. And so you know, what I say to young people in this commencement address, I was saying, like, you come out of college and you're uncertain. Can I get a job? Who do I need to talk to? Who do I need to network with? What job do I get now so I can get this job later? And you can't avoid that altogether. I'm not naive. But the more you constantly have a center that says, I'm in it ultimately for good reasons, for reasons bigger than myself. People will see that. And in the long run, that will pay off for you. So not to be on my soapbox, many people in the audience uh, are older than me and wiser than me and could give me a lot of advice about how to lead a successful life. So I apologize for preaching to you on this point. But I am passionate about it. I care deeply about thinking about how to be good at doing this job that is so important. Uh, and, and trying to do it well. And, and so it gets me launched off on these soliloquies. So <laughs> sorry about that. And on that note.